Hi, this is Richard from the Metal Cell Podcast. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Alex CF um, on the show. Alex is many things. He's an artist, he's an illustrator, he's an author, he's a vocalist, he's a label owner, a museum creator, clothes designer. Anything else, Alex? Um, Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I think that's everything for now. Wow. <laughs> yeah, welcome to the show, man. Fair Thank you. Welcome, Alex. Man. Delighted Cheers. to have you. And of course, absolutely delighted. Delighted. Howard, Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> our co-host down below. Good um, to see everybody. Are you, are you having a beer tonight, Howard? Are you? Um... I'm under. I'm under wine tonight. I'm, oh, being, I'm, I'm bringing up the, the intellectual class a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I've been feeling yeah. I'm out of my depth here, and I'm looking forward to it. Cheers, man. So I think man. That a few red wines will uh, will soften the palate. I have a pint of water, <laughs> so uh, I'm keen tap water. Um, yeah. Anyway, so yeah, thank you very much for inviting me. Yes, um, we've, we've, welcome. we've plenty to talk about, and um, I mean, at the moment, how are you dealing with this lockdown? Um, have you <laughs> seen any kind of anything to give you hope at the moment? Yeah, I, I think I'm I, like a lot of people. I think we're all suffering from kind of kind of PTSD after being told for over well over what, eighteen months that that we could die, and yeah. uh, and <laughs> I think that. Uh, you know, it's it's brought out every aspect of kind of um, human response, uh, be that you know the anti-vaxxers and the and the and the kind of like uh, anti-establishment that kind of that's come out of the right wing, and um, and also for people who suffer from anxiety and depression and things like that, like how you know for so many people who were struggling with you know um, being alone and and uh, and you know. A lot of things just doubled down and and for me i think like in the uk as i'm sure you're aware like in in england um things are opening up quite fast now like uh mm. and um i actually did an event on the weekend with my partner we did a, an art fair and i was very nervous about it all but they had quite strict kind of um uh you know policy you had to have a really double jab and you had to have taken a covid test and all this kind of stuff so um but it, there was just definitely a feeling of like is this okay? Should I be here? Like, am I yeah. am I breathing in? You know, uh, coronavirus. But I think that, yeah, just the general anxiety about things, quote unquote, returning to normal when they very much aren't. Yeah. Um, what about mm. creatively? Was um, did it uh, make you double your output? I wrote a book. Chance? <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I, uh, I I took it as a. Um, an opportunity to it seems like a lot of people did because it's been sitting in a pile at my copy editors for about six months a lot of people wrote books in the lockdown so um so yeah so I did that and I did a bunch of other shit um, <laughs> as I'm sure lots of people did <laughs> and did you oh. find Alex did you find Alex with um, with the lockdown that it shaped the writing of the book I know it's a companion piece to uh, the trope from which we sing yeah. but uh, this new book uh, the errata um, so it's written as a companion piece, but did you find that the situation we all found ourselves in shaped the direction that that took? Would it have taken a different direction if it wasn't for the pandemic, for example? Um, well, the, the book I actually, because I wrote the errata, the errata came out just before, uh, well, all this in 2019. The, the book I wrote is the sequel to Seek Throne, which we sing. So it's a novel, it's not illustrated, but it's, um, yeah, like very much so because it's uh, set in a post-apocalyptic world, ah. really, like a po post-civilization um where humans aren't you know it's actually mostly from the perspective of a human but it's which is very different from the first book but it's yeah it definitely dealt with the ideas of 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 the new normal if you like or the new mm. world or seeing things through a different set of eyes so the protagonist without giving too much away has to relearn how to see the world through a different person's eyes or a different um character's eyes and and unlearn the many things that we took for granted so yeah there's a definitely a, an aspect of the of pandemics in general and and our relationship with nature and and animal agriculture and how you know that we the, the more we ignore the fact that we are an animal within an ecosystem the more we put ourselves at risk um mm. so yeah so yeah it did <laughs> <laughs> and is it still called wretched is the husk or have you changed it is the yeah 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 it's okay, wretched is the husk, yeah and how how are you going to release that or have you got a book deal or oh god no no diy mm. um i'd love to have a publisher just because it would be really nice to have someone help me yeah um, <laughs> but uh i did have a literary agent but um 
ironically it's actually quite a good story um uh, ironically she after months she's a wonderful person um doesn't like fantasy and i was writing fantasy and then uh not that long after we kind of parted ways she had became the person who had to represent the, the estate of Richard Adams, who wrote Watership Down. Oh, so, wow. Uh, she went from one uh, one animal fantasy to <laughs> the animal the fantasy. Yeah. And then, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, uh, which is ironic because apparently uh, they brought up the when that the daughters of Richard Adams were kind of um, cleaning house, Fall of Ephrafa came up in their interview and they were saying, well, what about this band that are like, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, using the names and terminology? She's like, oh, I'm sure it's nothing. And like, and I never thought of it, you know, is it intellectual property? Like, is it, I guess you could, I mean, I'm sure there are laws are saying you can, you can pay homage to things, but yeah, of course. I thought it was yeah. really funny that it, that came it, up in. It kind of feels more like a, a reimagining of the, of the story more than a, a blatant sort of, um, use of the material you know oh yeah i mean it's it's completely like like he so he was aware of it before he died um someone sent me a link oh great like a that's twitter, class it, yeah twitter interview where someone said did you know that there's a band based on but there are a couple there are a couple of bands and people who wrote songs and stuff about about watership down i mean obviously it was a really important part of my my childhood um one of a, a bunch of books that my my mum introduced me to um so yeah, so yeah, he was so he I, he didn't seem at all offended. He was like, yeah, it's cool. It was a story I wrote, and I'm glad people liked it. So that's you know that's cool. Um, and about your mom, Alex, um, was she a teacher? Or had she just um, a fantastic taste in literature? Or? She did have a fact. She does have a fantastic. Yeah, she's um, yeah, she has. Uh, she actually gave me recently. She gave me a beautiful original copy of uh, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner with all the original plates and um yeah she introduced me to like uh tolkien um she read the hobbit and some of the silmarillion to us when we were kids and my mm -hmm. sister and i um but yeah we had this there was a bookshelf outside my bedroom which was just full of like classic literature c.s lewis and all kinds of stuff and and yeah like kind of introduced me to like classic fantasy um but it actually was wasn't until my stepmom who was really into science fiction and fantasy introduced me to science fiction and fantasy <laughs> uh, and, uh, um, and that kind of cemented my especially um brian froud who did all the design work on the dark crystal um he mm. did this book called the the world of the dark crystal which i actually have somewhere around here um and it was a kind of natural history of the world of the dark crystal the, the mm. thra the, the planet it takes place on and i remember going every time i stayed with my parents with my dad and my stepmom i would read this book in the spare room and just obsess over it and be like this is I want to do this when I'm older and so when I did the errata it was kind of like a homage to that it was like a, oh you know 30 odd years later I actually fucking did it so that was um <laughs> <laughs> so that was cool and what, um, what about your art style again was that through sketches when you were in your teens and just like are you trained did you go to no, art no, college no. or anything like that I, I did I did a, a BTEC national diploma uh, my art teacher didn't like what I did um one of my teachers actually said once um when I was, uh, he was quite Christian and I was hanging up my end of year uh, work and they were on these like temporary walls and I did these awful kind of Giga inspired fucking hideous, I mean, they were fucking hideous paintings <laughs> and the fucking thing fell on me and it, with, without a, 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 an ounce of humor. He turned and said, that's God telling you not to make uh, this art oh, so, uh, jesus christ I got, fucking, I got a fucking a so i'm like you know you know i i <laughs> I, I, I uh i enjoyed doing shitty giga so yeah so uh, giga hr geek was a huge influence uh, on me. like ev i'm every watching other. the aliens trilogy with my son at the moment and we're loving it amazing mm. amazing mm. yeah like he was such a big influence on me and again my mom got me uh his book hrgiga.com um when i was in my teen like late teens early 20s and um i actually got to go to his museum about eight years oh, ago oh wow that's yeah, that. cool. yeah was tom g warrior there <laughs> no, no unfortunately but there were loads of people wearing lederhosen um, it was like goth, it was like equal parts goth and lederhosen it was, it was absolutely bizarre um, <laughs> but yeah but yeah just i think like every other like person of my age around like the late 90s because i was born in 81 so late 90s art college um yeah just anything that was kind of against like well it's just every generation was the same weren't they if you're an artist you're mm -hmm. a rebel you know um 
but it's interesting because I think a lot of people who go to art college who are you know who become classically trained like you know they will end up being the fine artists and then you have all the outsiders and I guess I'm one of those outsiders because you know I'm fucking terrible at promoting myself and and uh you know, yeah, I've, I've been to art college myself, Alex. Um, I have a degree in art. I was born the same year as yourself, too, in 1981. So it would have, been, it would have been around the same time. But yeah. I, I can definitely relate to that. Um, the thing that art college did to me was it just ruined my love of it for a long time. <laughs> I found that it was just like an indoctrination of methods and processes and any sort of instinct that you had to go down a certain route was blocked immediately. And as I come back to the classic the way of thinking, come back to the to the institution's way of putting your art out there. I could never marry to it, like, and it, yeah. um, it was it was tough. And I, I don't think I learned much about what to do, but I learned a lot about what not to do. But that's <laughs> the truth. Like, why, why would you ever need to try and make primary colours out of tertiary colours? Like, why, <laughs> why, why would you, like, being why told Why is there that, a rule? <laughs> like, like, it's like the fact that my art teacher was like, your anatomy is all wrong. I'm like, it's deliberately not right. <laughs> <laughs> And the best thing, the best thing was when I was doing my interview to go to, 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 to do my degree and my art teacher said, you know, I was a street punk then. I was like, bondage trousers, 20 hole Dr. Martins, mohawk, you know, discharge back jacket. <laughs> and, um, and, my, and I said, how should I go to the interview? Should I like normalize my yeah, do you like, tone no. yourself down you know? yeah and they was like no go as flamboyantly as you want i think i wore fucking those butt flaps you know the flaps of material <laughs> oh, that hang down that you put extra i look like a like a i don't know what i look like but um <laughs> she took one look at me and was like you are not coming to this university <laughs> <laughs> and that was that <laughs> so yeah um i'm glad was... you brought that up actually because um again culturally um being like I'm born in 1971, so I got the tail end of punk more so. Yep. And um, so when you were going dressed as as that, like what bands were you listening at the time? Was Peaceful uh, Out? Was that your kind of holy bible, the peaceful? Uh, no, it's basically my, I was, um, so I got into skate punk when I was in my teen, teen, teenage years. My sister got into rock music before me mm -hmm. um, and uh, Nirvana and stuff like that. And then I got into like no effects and Ah. I had this, I had this actually like a, this kind of um, turning point where I was getting bullied a lot at school and I ran away from the bullies and ran into the computer room and I met all the nerds who were playing lemmings on the computer and I, they were listening <laughs> lemmings. to, uh, yep, <laughs> and listening to The Clash and Green Day and all that stuff and then, you know, I fell in with, um, with, with, with that whole movement and then I actually had a pen friend in Pittsburgh, um, <laughs> so this would have been around 19, so 1999. No, 1997, because I, I met her in 1998. Um, and she would send me mixtapes of like Pittsburgh punk bands like Else Rotten and Anti Flag and, or Anti Flag and um, uh, Global Threat, The Unseen, all these kind of bands. Like, and uh, I kind of, it was like this lovely introduction to a world that felt very remote from me, very like fantastical in a way. Like, mm -hmm. there was this place where you know punk was rich and alive and there were bands that i loved and i didn't really have that connection in the uk and so i was lucky to make friends with people who were you know much more into a lot more the classic punk and then i got into crass and discharge and uh rudimentary peni and um i actually did my dissertation at art college on on um, nick blinko from rudimentary peni and and um so i got into anarcho-punk and peace punk and stuff like that and then like more crusty stuff like the Varukas and uh like amoebics and stuff like that and then um a slight detour into ska punk <laughs> and then back yeah, to it was uh, gonna be inevitable <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah one, of, one of my first bands was a ska punk band which was really fun because it was like just a kind of silly thing to like gain some confidence in in myself and um and I remember the first show we did where I was so nervous I came on stage with an American accent and, uh, oh. and it was just, oh, Jesus Christ, and, and, uh, my partner reminded me that there's a scene in Friends where where uh, where um, Ross comes on to and he has an English accent and he has to kind of keep it going because <laughs> he's so and I'm like Jesus Christ. Uh, so yeah, so I did that and then um, yeah, I, I think around like early 2000s I got into like um, power violence and eventually emo crust which is the music that kind of really mm. 
stuck with me, and I guess some people call it neo crust. You missed those days. I mean, Edwig, the big thing about those days was it was pre internet, as we know yes. now, and yes. uh, the idea of a fantastical land in, in Pittsburgh and so on was real because you couldn't. Uh, um, connect to it on the internet, you just kind of got feedback from it, you listened to music from there, you pictured in your head the fantasy of the place. And oh, I, God, I yes. kind of lost that a little bit now, I think. It's very hard to find bands where they, where it just opens up this avenue of you don't know a whole lot, you know? 100%. And this is actually why I started, like, for me, like, I didn't ever want anything I did to be... Like, I, I, I liked the anonymity of, of bands, like... Mm. You know, you know, I would read Slug and Letter Zine or or um, Maxim Rock and Roll, and I'd see. I, I actually remember seeing the review for Remains of the Day, the first Remains of the Day record in Fractured magazine. It's funny; I've actually been trying to hunt down that copy of Fractured magazine. It was a, a UK punk zine, newspaper punk zine. Um, I bought a couple of copies on eBay, just trying to find this one issue where it's like. You know, I think they called it crust in name only, this emo crust, like they were so against it, but it was to me it was like this incredible melancholy, this this, you know, idea of Portland and Oregon being this like rain I remember reading in like a detestation record about, you know, it rains like three hundred days a year and like mm. and I was thinking these all these crusties living in trees with dreadlocks and <laughs> broken umbrellas and and I was just like and I, and that was literally what the um what's his name the uh it's the, the he did the Husher I think it is or Hush he does Hush I think he does these beautiful illustrations at the top of Slug and Letters scene um pictures of crusties living in trees with um, broken umbrellas and I was like this is how, how I imagine them and I, yeah. I just I that was that was it you know putting you know putting euros into a envelope and sending it off into ether to like eastern europe europe or somewhere and then getting like you know i remember getting a tragedy hoodie in a tiny little box he'd managed it was insane society records he tried to he managed to get it in this tiny little box a tragedy hoodie with the the tragedy uh the pile of tires but uh, car tires and i was just i was just like this is amazing and just falling in love with the kind of again as he said like the fantasy of it all this mm. like remoteness of it like and there was the great filter of like if ebullition records or something would carry your record or if havoc records would put your record out like that was the great filter of like you know especially towards like the uh, like the early 2000s late 90s you got like his hero is gone and yeah. you know all those bands that were like uh kind of coming out of that scene and reinvigorating punk and hardcore mm -hmm. and and they were there wasn't we're so oversaturated with everything now there's there's no mm. you know you can listen to like everything and i think people have become so um flippant and and dismissive of music they won't you know i've i've read reviews of our records that have appeared on those record review sites before it's possible for them to have listened to the whole record yeah it was so fucking long i think there's that thing is like there's, a, there's this need for content over experience yeah, yeah over substance yeah and it's easy to see because, like you said, there's so much lost in this. And when people are putting up reviews of your stuff before you even had a chance to get people to listen to it, they were even listening to it themselves. And um, that's just a sad indication of the way things are going with music in, in that sense, that there's a sort of a, a facade in front of it. So you have to break through to actually get to the content. And uh, yeah. um, the only good thing that's coming out of it, I think, is, is you, you were, I find myself more listening to the, what the music is rather than what people are saying about it. And that, that's the one positive thing I have found about it is that you do have to actually listen to things now to get an opinion rather than, you know, take a five second clip off Instagram and decide upon that, yeah. I, you know. <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> as well as that, you know, the style of writing, the journalism back in the day was absolutely fantastic as well, because you yes. wouldn't mm -hmm. you wouldn't have necessarily the means to listen to the album. But if you had a favorite two or three journalists, you could trust them and read yeah, what they absolutely. have to say and exactly. buy on the strength of it, you know. And yeah, we, still, you, we still have that today, I think, a little bit, but just not as much, not as not as refined. Mm -hmm. I don't think. Yeah, but everyone's. I guess now it's like anyone can be a journalist, and there isn't mm -hmm. necessarily a, you know, you. I, if I reading Maximum Rock Roll, or any of those zines of that of that ilk, where you'd have different, you know, writers would have their columns or they'd have their review sections, and yeah, you know, and you would you would. I mean, I would would scan through the back of zines and just look for the capitalized band names to see if I'm going to read the review. So you know. For me, in like you know, early two thousands, it was tragedy and remains of the day. Anything that sounded like those bands, because that was like the thing when the first tragedy record came out, and everyone was like, "Oh my fucking god, this is incredible!" Because you know, a lot of people were very dismissive of 
of his hero, you know, his hero is gone, reforming, doing longer form songs, whether it would be as good as this, you know, you know, formative band. But, um, but yeah, I think that was, and I think when I did, when we started doing Moro, I wanted to kind of recapture that feeling of like discovering something that you could, that people would put some work into and, and not, you know, I wanted to, I actually wanted to make it not as easy to get hold of, but, I, you know, obviously a band is a shared experience. So it's, and you can't, you can't, it's just, it's the nature of the world. You can't take the clocks back, can you? You can't reset oh, things. You, you can't, can't move the internet. <laughs> you got to move it really, haven't you? You know, as terrifying it is. But it's interesting that when you, you I know that you're a real aficionado of flora and fauna and nature and things like that. Um, how do you feel about the way things are going for the future of the human race in terms of AI and uh, kind of moving away from this kind of nature-based thinking? Do you feel, do you feel, I've read an interview with you previously where you seemed very pessimistic about how things were going for us, and that was maybe 10 years ago. I'm just wondering, has your opinion changed that time or has it developed? Yeah, I think it has. I think I, I have a more of a... Um idea of how you know so i'm not anti-technology but i i'm i am very cautious of how we use technology and i think that there's obviously a, a lot of people far far more intelligent than me that could talk about this stuff but i think it's just a case of like you know we have the means to fundamentally change the way that we have our relationship with nature and and make it more um symbiotic but it's because it's so counterintuitive in a capitalist society it's not possible and I think there are you know I have friends who are anarchists and uh, and you know very much you know want to replace this system with with one without you know central power systems and and can you know um, governments government in the state that they are now but I think that there's there's always going to be collateral and and it's always going to be lives and um, I think that utopias aren't possible I think I mean, I'm terrified and I'm like everybody else who's who's kind of, you know, aware of the effects of climate change. Like I am a very anxious person. So, you know, I I remember getting becoming upset when it was, you know, warm in, you know, uh, October. And, and, you know, this was 10, 15 years ago and thinking this isn't normal. You know, where are the seasons gone now? You know, it's just it's just gone. You know, like we've seasons have disappeared and and, and it's 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 unfortunate that the people who are in control are those who are either denial de in denial of it or just don't care um but it's i i'm hopeful because i have a niece and nephew and i want them to live a long and happy life and i don't want them to suffer and i'm i have to be hopeful i have to be hopeful that 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 generation and it seems to me that you know a lot of the people a lot of the kids are you know far more open-minded and far more accepting of of not just you know the concept of site of climate change and 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 empirical evidence and um but also their attitude towards um you know lgbtqa and and um you know it's just they just don't have the prejudices and it's the parents who are so i don't know what to do with this information like you know <laughs> yeah. i have plenty of friends who've got kids who've turned around and said like they're you know trans or queer or you know they want to be you know they have their, their chosen pronouns and and these kids are like 12 13 and it's you know even if it's just part of their growing you know growing up they're still aware of it and they're still taking it into consideration and they're not judging each other on it and it's that's amazing of course there's always going to be awful bullies and you know all the things mm -hmm. that happen and then kids who grow up with very controlling conservative parents and mm -hmm. all this stuff but there is a lot of hope there and i i just hope it's fast enough for those kids to have to you know to 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 um act out their hope their own kind of hope for the future but i i, I, I see I, what you mean i mean i i went back to to school uh, as a sna a special needs assistant about five right. years ago and um i was just blown away by the difference between when i went to school yeah. and the way it is now it's just it's it's not even com you couldn't even compare it it's just it's crazy you know the world is moving and uh, it's moving really really fast and a lot of it is for the good i mean i see a lot of bad too but I find that most of the bad stuff you see in the world at the moment are people of our generation and above. Yeah, but I do feel that this new sweep of, of um, kids and young adults coming through are just far more aware of the world. They're far more tuned in. Um, they have a simpler look at things, I think, in a, such a complicated world. To me, it's just so complicated. I, I've no you know, rhyme or reason to, to try to figure anything out. I just go with the flow and try not to offend anybody. But 
I do see it with kids, they can simplify it so easily. It's like, why would you be annoyed at that? Or Exactly, exactly. You know, it's, just it's like, <laughs> and it's a yes or no, and you're like, oh yeah, mm-hmm. why, why am I? I don't give a fuck, you know? <laughs> Again, like I have a 13-year-old and his um, knowledge is fantastic, but also he still loves the magical side of things, the fantasy side of things, you know, the mm-hmm. Harry Potters, all the Star Wars and stuff. And it just brings me on nicely to the Merlin cryptid collection. <laughs> How did that come about? That, was, is... a, that was an amazing segue, by the way. <laughs> I do it the whole time. I do it the whole time. <laughs> uh, <Smooth machine. laughs> the the Marilyn Cryptic Collection. Um, uh, it, it's a it's a it's a it's almost a sore spot, to be honest. Um, oh, don't uh, say that. It, it, well, it's uh, you know I spent thirteen years of my life working on it, uh, mm. and and some of it uh, the tail end of kind of getting over my illness and um it was a you know it was it was a wonderful experience in escapism and and uh, a love of like turn of the century science fiction mm-hmm. you know hg wells and um Edgar rice burroughs and hb lovecraft and blah 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 and all those those people and um you know it i wanted it to be something that was was kind of just pure escapism but through the lens of darwinian biology if all of these things existed how would they fit into the world like how would we classify them what would they be and you know take any kind of mythological creature and give it a kind of a a a grounding in reality its relationship to other species and 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 it was for a for a long time it was a it was just a way of making a living i would i would um I would curate the collection and sell some of the pieces and um and kind of continue to add to the um encyclopedia of the of the Marilyn collection and the mythology around him and his work um but it, I think it unfortunately towards the end coincided with the rise in this kind of concept of the personal truth or um you know alternative facts and it kind of um became something very different and suddenly it went from people who were recognizing the kind of references to fiction and stuff and being excited you know about that to people thinking it was all real Mm. um and then i started getting these emails from people saying that they were staking a claim that it was their family inheritance or that they were going to burn down my museum or they were going to um more recently someone said they were going to write a discrediting biography about thomas Marilyn if i didn't share all information pertaining to the Marilyn collection and i was like you can't write about a cop well, not a copywriter but you can't write about somebody else's work and they're like well, then they were offended because they realized that they thought it was real and thomas Marilyn was real uh and the I was withholding information so I've been accused of being part of the Illuminati (laughs) you know that I should be sharing this information with the world and I just it made me really unhappy it was really really oh man that's terrible you know and it went you know it's the 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 good thing that happened was uh maybe four four years ago now uh, a museum in Copenhagen got in touch with me a lovely guy called Leaf um who was a curator of a actual museum um, and he commissioned me to make uh, like 15 or 20 specimens for his museum, uh, the Museum yes. Lolland Foster. And that's now a there, permanent collection where, you know, it's the seven foot werewolf, taxidermied werewolf and wow. various, you know, <laughs> bits and pieces. I've never been there. Um, I never will because I'm too much of a control freak and I'll just be like, ah, this isn't right. You need to move this and do this. And anyway. um, but uh, I think that that was like a nice kind of like, you know, and I, I, you know, I, some weird things happened. Like I had a, a I had a Skype meeting with uh, the head of uh, Skydance Entertainment for Paramount about turning it into the Harry Potter for adults. And, you know, I had a, oh. fi- you know, I had a film deal. Uh, we even had a director, um, Brad something or other, who was the director of, he did the second unit director on Planet of the Apes, the most recent Planet of the Apes. Um, and he was attached to, to turn it into a film and then he just kind of sat on it for a year and stopped talking to us and then that was that oh, <laughs> and, just, and to be honest like i think like for, as far as that goes i i want people to enjoy it for what it is yes and, you know just to be a kind of like oh i love these things 
as much as this dude who made this crap like and just enjoy it for the kind of like mythology again like the world building the idea of like the like brian froud did with the dark crystal like creating the natural history of the world behind mm -hmm. a film that people were scared of in the 80s you know like he went all the way into like the ecology of it and the you know the living essence of the planet and then i kind of wanted to do that over and over again with the bands i've been involved in and with with um, my my novels now but and with the Marilyn collection and and i wrote a book of about the Marilyn and of collection and it's a all of Marilyn's diaries and i just got to the point was just like i don't think the world needs this right now and uh so i just kind of i've just put it on the back burner the only thing that's annoying Brilliant. is i have to pay for the i have to pay for the website to the domain for the website every year it's like 150 dollars and i usually don't have any money in my account so it's just sitting there in the background like <laughs> just taking money from me like uh that's the only thing that really happens with the Maryland collection now is i have to pay for the, the hosting of the site but <laughs> I, I thought it was incredible, um, uh, jaw-dropping, incredible. Um, myself, my son, and my wife were looking at it uh, that's, yesterday. That's for you. It's for you. The whole thing's for you. That's what exactly. I always said to people who emailed me and said, "I really enjoyed this. Thanks for doing it." I'm like, "Yeah, this is for you. Like, I, you understand what it's for, and and you know, I don't have any. I had never had any delusions of it being any more than just like a of of that, and also like you know, I used to be a comic artist and. I made no money from being a comic artist. I think when I got to the point where I could make a living, it was I got a, a distribution deal with Diamond in America, and I realised that I would make something like eight pence per comic, and I just couldn't afford to pay my rent. I just come off this disability benefit for being ill for like eight years, and I was like, I can't do this. And then I just started making things because it was fun, and then I realised that I could sell these things and and live off myself which was with wonders for my self-esteem as someone who wanted to do so much but physically couldn't um and it became a way of doing that and and it was awesome for for a while and then it just became something else but then that's the nature of again we're talking about music and putting stuff into the world is that the moment you create something and put it into the world it's no longer yours it's, yes. it's yeah. owned by yeah. other people and you know yeah. just as much as those bands or films or books that we've all read that profoundly changed us yeah. you know you're lucky if you can profoundly change anyone you know but if you can make something that people kind of understand and appreciate or are inspired by or whatever that's fucking amazing. that's the whole point of it is just like to be able to have that moment with someone and say oh yeah i totally get why you did that that's so cool i'm really glad you did that that's really nice and that's enough you know that's all you really hope for um and i think that the moment it becomes distorted is the moment you kind of have to let go of it and just be like yeah that Let's do something else. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> that's what I did. But yeah. And um, Alex, you said there that you were sick for a while, well, like years, is it? What happened? Yeah, yeah. I was um, so I was diagnosed with ME uh, and uh, my myalgic encephalomyelitis. I think that's how you say it. But um, so I was very ill. So I went to New York in 1998 to meet my pen friend. That was mm. actually it was a school trip, a uh, college trip. Um, I went to New York and got very, very sick on the flight. And for the first day in New York, I was just completely out, f massive fever, couldn't do anything. Next day, felt absolutely fine. And, you know, had a great time in New York and uh, went, you know, came home and then just started feeling rough and a lot of pain in like in my, in my um, joints and under my arms and my groin and, and just feeling awful. and didn't really have any way of really understanding it i went to a doctor and they they said like sounds like you had a glandular fever and um they took a blood test and they said there was evidence that i'd, I'd had a, a a fever or virus um and then it just got worse and worse and worse and i was working as a graphic designer i got a job as a graphic designer working with this awesome dude who was a rockabilly guy and he introduced me to like you know photoshop and all this kind of stuff and um and I just was getting more and more sick and missing more and more days of work. And there was a point where the company was going to merge with another company. And I sat down with the accountant because they had to make me redundant and then re-sign me on. And he sat there with his pen and he said, my daughter's just been diagnosed with ME and I don't think you'll, you should sign this contract because you'll be unable to fulfill your role. And I was like, it was quite a f powerful moment. 
Um, but I was diagnosed uh, like 1999, 2000, and then I was kind of ill until 2007. Um, so I would basically like be bedridden three days a week. Um, and just like a general, I think they, it's, it's, it's more like the pain. I was in a pain a lot. I was on a lot of like, which is the fibromyalgia side of it, the, the kind of um, pain and just fatigue, not like yawny tired. It was like just drained all the time and everything was really hard. And um, so I would draw and I drew comics and I drew about my condition. I drew like a kind of like allegory of my, of Emmy. It was like a horror, zombie horror um, comic book. And I, um, incidentally about a zombie ho rabbit <laughs> so rabbits have always been like a, a theme um being, well, we were uh, talking um before we came on here and um i was saying how much i want and and his work and so on and i really do and alex quite humbly said that he's no one to be admired but um it's something that's close to my own heart um alex is the the chronic fatigue and things like that i have people in my life my significant other has Bechet's disease very similar to emmy right yeah. and i just find that the the endeavor that it takes to get things done and to get things done as well in your lifetime in your career be it music books uh, illustrations whatever it has been um it's just it's, it's it's amazing and people don't realize what chronic fatigue actually means for a person it means you don't really get to decide what you do that day it's, it's not up to you and it can be you look fine you see and people That's just interpret the, yeah. that you're that's that's the that's the really fucked up thing is because people will say to you, you look great and you're like yeah but i'm not doing great i'm not able to fulfill my week here yeah. so i do admire that alex and, and i think it's worthy of admiration because it's fantastic body work that you have and to, to do it in the circumstances that you're in is is quite remarkable in any context and you should be proud of it well i i think it's i i appreciate i i, th I think it's um i think a lot of it is it comes back to like how how we feel about ourselves um especially in relation to our parents which we talked about before this um and the idea of like work ethic and mm. you know something that my i remember a really poignant moment in my life when i would you know my my father and i hadn't been talking for a while because i had to quit my job as a graphic designer and and i think he took that quite hard and and you know he didn't have a particularly he didn't have a knowledge of of me or fibromyalgia and we didn't speak for a long time after that and i remember i went to a comic convention in birmingham or somewhere and my sister was living up north that, that way at the time and i <clears throat> went to see her and i had all of my comics out on the table i'd done like a little you know i'd done a stall and whatever and and she'd invited my dad over and which i you know at the time i didn't really want to see him but um mm. and he remember him looking at them he's like you yeah, you can make a living from this and i was like that's what i'm trying to do you know like i drawn at that point i'd drawn eight comics in my bed <laughs> like because that's all i could do was like lie there and draw and i remember doing because i'd have i called them me days when they were really bad when i'd just be like and it was so incredibly frustrating because you know i wanted to do everything and i couldn't do mm. anything and i think that you know when i started to feel better and i said this many times before i think doing something actually I, w I kind of worked myself better which is probably a really unhealthy way to look at at our relationship with work and you know especially this is long before the days of you know practicing self-care and all these kind of like you know terminologies that, that we hear all the time now it's like as far as i was concerned i had to work myself better you know i had to work to prove my worth to my parents to my to the world you know and you know i did all these ridiculous things to try and do that and you know i think like that was the thing and i remember like um you know i remember ringing up the uh disability office and saying that i wanted to cancel my disability benefits and they were like sorry what you, you want to cancel it i'm like <laughs> yeah. yeah i'm feeling better i think i should probably and it was like such a lovely conversation with this person it was just like i this is just so wonderful i hope you all do, do really well and i was just and it felt so good because you know i, I distinctly remember uh the day that i had to quit my job as a graphic designer i was in complete shock and i was walking through the high street and two very strange things happened one of them this guy came up to me and said are you okay i said i'm sorry i've just had some bad news he's like do you want to talk about it and i was in such a daze and he led me into this bookshop and he led me downstairs <laughs> 
and he, was, he said, I think I can show you something to help me, help you. And there was a stand, and it was fucking Scientology, you know, it's like Dianetics. And I was like, <laughs> Jesus Christ! <laughs> and I remember walking out, and I, got, and I had to go... Thank to you, I, I know, I Thank God you said Scientology. <laughs> <Jesus>. <laughs> and uh, I went to... Uh, I, went, I had to go to the bank and, and cancel my business account. And, they, and the woman was like, why are you cancelling this? It's like, oh, I've been diagnosed with ME. And she just turned around and said, yuppie flu. And I just burst what? out. I burst out into tears. <laughs> I was like, you've no fucking wow. idea how shit I feel all of the oh my time. God. And, and she was obviously really taken aback because she hadn't ever, you know, maybe it was just a, you know, a, a moment of like, she'd heard about it from other people. It was a thing that, you know, especially in the 80s, it was like, lazy people have yuppie flu and all this stuff and it's like you know i had to go to an me clinic and there are people in wheelchairs and there are people who can't walk to the end of their road and you know my my half sister actually was diagnosed with me uh maybe 10 years after me and she couldn't she was practicing to play cello and her wrists hurt so much that she couldn't hold her bow and it's like things like that that people just don't hear about these things because mm. it's not yeah. because it has stigma and as you said you know the idea that you look fine yeah you don't have your arms not falling off and you know whatever but like you can have cancer and look fine it's just yeah. a very and again it comes back to this idea of how we see work how we see our relationship with work what is work do we have to be in an office to prove that we are working you know this kind of yeah uh, and this year has proven that you don't actually need to be in office to do work and actually you might do more work if you're not in an office so uh <laughs> so there you go <laughs> there's a segue um <laughs> sorry um and, so yeah. and um do you know we we'll said the scripts for those comics that you wrote alex and did a lot of those scripts um translate to lyrics as well where were you in relation to music at that stage so uh so around 2004 six 2005 i moved to well 2004 i moved to brighton and i met um i met uh neil who played guitar in fall of Ephrafa, um and we became firm friends he was kind of like a friend of a friend and um friendship group that you know i remember we were talking about doing doing a project together um and i think i conned him into being in a band with me by saying that we do a death metal band um I don't think that he had any idea what I had in mind. Um, and then I met Mikey through through the punk scene, um, Mikey D. We became firm friends. We we had I, we have a day that we've we've spoken about many times. This profoundly lovely day when he brought a bunch of records over to my house and we listened to Neurosis and Salvation by Cult of Luna and I played him. Uh, remains of the day and a bunch of stuff and we realized that there were similarities between these two genres of music which is basically heavy and pretty um and we decided that we would do this band and, you know years and years before i basically toured with my friend's band selling my my comics at shows um doing merch um, what was the name of that band give them a shout out <laughs> they were called Howard's Alias, and they were a uh, hey! progressive <laughs> ska band. Uh, and the the bassist of Howard's Alias is Stevie, who went on to be the guitarist in one of the guitarists in Fall of Ephrafa. Um And I was good friends with all those guys. And and then so I remember we were on tour once, and Stevie was reading Watership Down, and I was like, you know, we're talking about the the at the beginning of of some of the chapters. There's little. Um, quotes from other books and mm. um, I remember think, thinking we should do a band like based around the mythology in this you know that the mythology in this book you know and then roll forward you know six or seven years we actually you know started talking about it um, he moved to Brighton and then we started Fall of Ephrafa and it was uh, <clears throat> for me it was very like important from just from the idea of working with other people and like you know we I never ever thought that we would get anywhere with it and you know the first record we did was basically i thought that was going to be it we do this record and that would be it you know um but we just got on really well and we had went through a couple of different guitarists and drummers and stuff and then eventually i was really good friends with george and he was in a band called farewell to arms a band called dead by dawn um a bunch of other stuff and he was just a really good d-beat drummer he was playing he was playing in Flyblown at the time who were like just a really good d-beat band and he came to see us play and and uh 
he said you guys are good but you'd be better if i was your drummer and uh and then he moved to brighton and then we we started practicing you're hired and, uh, straight away yeah <laughs> he is an incredible he doesn't, sadly doesn't drum anymore he's he's a he's um he was actually very ill with a with a uh, um a disease uh, i don't want to misquote but I've, I've actually known a few people have it and it was really a, affecting his back he was in a lot of pain especially in the when we recorded the last record and he had to fundamentally change his whole life and you know and now he's, he's just had his first child and he's he's doing interpretive dance and all kinds of really awesome wow. stuff and um and uh so that was that was that but um he's um his d beat was fucking great i remember him being very happy that the drummer from wolf brigade thought he was a really good drummer so uh <laughs> <laughs> that was really cool um but uh and well, how did she um, you guys have a the week where her the beat stuff is fucking amazing but a uh, big shout out to michael douglas there mickey d uh his bass is fucking great sounding he holy is, shit yeah. like what a fucking sound just and brilliant he's he's one of my best friends and he's actually does vocals in morrow and when we play live he also does all of the because morrow has this kind of bunch of people doing guest vocals and mikey will do all the guest vocal parts that i can't physically do because it's too many yeah lyrics. yeah lyrics <laughs> so it's it's been really lovely because every single band i've done since fall of epifer i have asked mikey to be involved and he very politely <laughs> would always say uh, thank you very much for asking but no and then morrow came along and and i which i'm quite surprised because it's sonically very similar to fall of epifer and you know after that band ended there was definitely this feeling of like um like the end of a relationship and it was mm. it was it was mm. profoundly moving and it changed me it made me very very sad and and i think it affected all of us in very different ways and it, it took me years and i'm still not over it definitely not over it now and i you know i you have to be quite like po-faced about the whole like you know when people ask about oh would you ever do the band again and i have to speak for everyone because not everybody else in the band is you know i mean mikey has an amazing podcast uh, which where he talks about you know these um you know his favorite musical experiences some that we've shared and he talks about um he just has this incredible kind of eloquent voice and he's so incredibly intelligent and he's who i turn one of the many people i turn to when i need that kind of like grounding um perception of reality and mm -hmm. and he does you should listen is um are we still into this i think that's <laughs> and um anyway uh you'll put a link <laughs> um and uh i have a terrible memory um but yeah like i would you know if i ever get asked would you ever do the band again oh no no i speak for the rest of the band you know we'd have to all be involved of course i fucking want to do the band again like i would mm. love to i would love to play those songs we we didn't get to play them very much we didn't tour very much was, i hate touring it's quite a short it was quite a short span of time all right i mean it was only a couple yeah. of years when you look at it but yeah then... definitely I think that uh, fans of the, of the of your music would be absolutely blown away to see you guys back a road burn or something like that. I think it would be magical for anybody that grew up in the in the um, East listening to your music. You know, I hope. I hope. It, yeah. <laughs> no, it, 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 sadly, it won't ever happen. We definitely wouldn't play road burn, but <laughs> uh, it, we, it would have to be a squat in Germany, uh, and and I, I'm not joking. It would literally have to be a squat in Germany. Um, and I, I just think that like, we were, we never wanted to be part of like the, we, just, we were just a shitty punk band, you know, we just wanted to be a shit. We wanted to be Madame Germaine. We wanted to be, uh, um, remains of the day or tragedy when, I mean, tragedy played massive shows, but like they were still self-governed DIY band, you know, Todd Burdett, the, the, the guitarist from tragedy is like one of my favorite guitarists. Everything he does, I think is incredible. And, um, you know, they, they, they were like the archetype of that kind of like, I just do it yourself, you know, like mm -hmm. don't, you don't need to, to, and I'm sure they've had their offers and whatever, they were massive for a while, but, um, but I think for us, we just wanted to just wanted to play some shows and, you know, we met lots of really cool people and bands that went on to do massive things. You know, we played a, you know, Armin Ra, we played a show in a pub with them and, um, now they're like, you know, one of the biggest bands in, in, in that genre of metal mm. um post whatever um and i think that's you know that's something that's you know it, it opens up lots of opportunities and you know especially if you have our band with with a, a, a massive scope and and have like this artistic you know like neurosis or mm. um godspeed you black emperor or something like that where you kind of have 
your, your gigantic band, but you can still have that level of like control over the things that you create and, yeah. you know, um, and, uh, but I don't ever, I, I don't think we would ever want to do that. And well, I, you, I mean, you ended things on your terms, which is crucial, but what, um, yeah, we did. Yeah. But I think, yeah. But like, what can you remember much about um, the whole production of those albums? Who you got involved, and was there any particular standout moments for you as a singer in? in uh, yeah, I remember all of it. Um, you know, we uh, for, for all albums were recorded by George, George's drummer, uh, George the drummer's brother. Sorry, so again, so George's brother is called Peter Miles, and he's a he's quite a, a famous record producer now. Um, we recorded all of our albums with him. We did everything with him, I think um and you know we we recorded the first one in it was a converted barn um i think it was like a grain silo where the vocals were done um and then the standout moments for that were you know sticking a dictaphone in the piano to record one of the the parts to make it sound you know old and broken which was really cool i've still got that dictaphone i've still got that recording um and you know i i struggling with the cello um and second record we recorded at uh pete and george's parents house in in devon which was utterly beautiful it had a had a river running through the garden and um we i think that was probably my best vocal experience i'd ever done vocals before and kind of just smashing it out and not having to worry too much about it and not destroying myself and and then the final record was um the saddest you know it was very much uh in retrospect i wish that we had taken some time out there was definitely a feeling of getting it done um getting fed up with each other and i have i have thought about this many many times that if we'd just taken a hiatus and just had a bit of a break and we did have plans for a fourth record that that never happened called zorn um and you know we we left it open i remember the when the final kind of day came when we had to kind of decide what we were going to do we were always going to put the cello from the beginning of the first record at the end of the last to kind of like mm -hmm. signify that uh, cyclical nature of the records the rise and fall of a civilization and and we were just like yeah let's put it in and so we put it in um and it was like i don't know i think i i wish that we'd just taken some time out but we were you know we were younger then and we just didn't really think about whether or not you know we would regret that and maybe you'd want to come back to it in a year or whatever but um but you know you live and learn and, and sure look what a song to end the warren of snares yeah though this uh yeah with um with the drums it's actually really funny if you listen this will probably ruin it for everyone but <laughs> but um if you listen right to the end of the record uh when we say for we are many there's a it, we, it's like for we are many and then you can just hear many and it's george's dad george's dad george's dad is the last voice to be heard on the full of the record which i in in hindsight is adorable because he didn't know what the fuck we were doing just do a gang do a gang vocal um and so his voice is immortalized on that record um oh that's amazing yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah go and listen to it now <laughs> I, like i've said it to the rest of the band and like i can i can't hear it I, i'm it's literally there like a, but to be honest it's kind of lovely because my mum did spoken word on in lay and my and stevie's dad did spoken word on elil um ah, so it's, cool. it's it's cool that you know um that george's dad had the last say <laughs> um and i yeah but then that's the thing is that these records are just like immortalizing these moments in your life and like mm. you know i have like weird moments of remembering things um but yeah i'm sure you both have thousands of moments like that that kind of those those turning points or moments where you did something that you're really you really love or or has an mm. emotional reaction and whatever but yeah so yeah the, the recording was always very good very useful very um productive peter was always really good at getting the best out of us and i did subsequent records with him um in other bands and also his record his um assistant became a record producer on his uh, on his own right james bragg and i did a bunch of records with him as well so uh, but now i rec we record everything with with bolty at stuck on your name records in in nottingham um oh yeah literally the literally the best one of the best 
record producers I've ever had the pleasure of knowing knows exactly what we want. He's just an awesome punk who's supported the Nottingham punk scene for years and you know he's just a lovely lovely person and I actually saw him uh, last weekend Dave from Mora and I went up to um, record with him well we're to reamp guitars and stuff for the new Moro record so and that was just lovely to see him again it's always nice to go up there and get a vegan Chinese and and it's, it's a great spot yeah. um, I played a show there myself just before the pandemic ah, there you go. in the yeah, summer yeah, yeah. and uh, I'd been there again previously about maybe seven or eight years I remember drinking a bottle of Ouzo in the studio <laughs> <laughs> a whole fucking bottle oh man but it was Jesus a, Christ. Especially, but it was a fantastic community up there um, it's one of my favourite gigs of all time it was just just lobbed into a fucking warm, dank room with, you know, 50 yes. people in it and it was brilliantly sweaty and it's the kind of thing you miss. You look back on it and you go, fuck, we did that and you're kind of going, when's that going to happen again? <laughs> yeah, he was, he was saying that Dawn Raid played, they really wanted to play at Stuck On Your Name and, and Stuck On Your Name and, you know, he was like, you should be playing a much bigger venue than this and they were like, no, we want to play there and it was... Oh, it's know, the place to go, man. I, you yeah. know, that, it really is. It's just, but that's it's just the special. thing, it's like, DIY spaces and you know that whole yeah. kind of there's no bouncer like it's just <laughs> yeah it's, it's I I I would take that a million times over any anywhere else although I'm not the person to ask because I'm a vocalist and not a guitarist and I'm told that if you're a guitarist being able to hear yourself makes all the difference and yeah. so, uh... <laughs> I think it's more the experience so really... of the room you're in than the, than the sound yes. <laughs> How are Tau important for Fall of Life, Rafa, in relation to Partalan and Jerome? Massive. Um, I, was late, I was late enough uh, to the party, if I'm honest. I was on tour in 2012 and we were playing a gig in Utrecht. And we were staying with Johan, who we've had on the show before, um, mm. from Thursday the Horde. And he had the, the three releases on vinyl. And I remember how excited our drummer got about this. He was just... <laughs> He hadn't seen this. He, he was such a huge fan. And, you know, I knew I'd heard him talk about you, but I always just said, I'm not listening to a 10 minute song. You know, I, I, I take that kind of attitude. Like, but I remember seeing the three vinyl records and just thinking, they look fucking great. They just look great, you know, and um, digging through it and then started to listen to it and realize what a fool I had been. But um, at that time, I was in a different band. But the mythology aspect of it, the interest in nature and so on, Pertlone is very much rooted in that. Um, where Pertlone himself was a mythological person who arrived as a second wave of invasions to Ireland, conquered the Formorians, which were representations of um, um, the Formorians and so on. Died within two weeks. And I found it for explaining yourself, if you know what I mean. So a lot of the ideas don't have the character part alone in mind, but it's a fantastic way of articulating what it is you're trying to say. So from that perspective, yeah, yeah. I, I, really, I really think that um, I, I struggle to find another band that has influenced, influenced us more collectively, especially myself and Alan. The Roses may be elements of Minra and Cult de Lune and so on, but in terms of the, the concept side of things, just, just having a clear narrative as to what's happening, yeah. the... the Watership down thing is just it's just beautifully done and it's it's really easy to understand that you're you know what I mean you don't have to you know it's one thing to have music be elusive but when you find it and it makes sense it's just an amazing thing and that was one of those moments for me it was late to the party but when I found it, it just made sense and it just set me off on this path of trying to articulate my own version of it so it's it's amazing for me to be speaking to yourself because you. You know, it's very rare that you get to talk to somebody who has influenced you so much. And I, I can't, it's hard to articulate, but um, I don't think Park Loan would exist in the form that it does now without your band. I really, really don't think so. And I'll be forever grateful for that. You know? Well, I, I'm, I'm really glad you enjoyed it. And I mean, I can't take the credit for it because obviously it was, a, it was a very much a joint effort with some amazing people who I'm incredibly glad to still be very close with. And, mm. you know, it was, um, you know, I, I, yeah, I think this is the same thing with, with, so for me, it was Remains of the Day. Like I, I've spent a lifetime trying to kind of capture this spirit, this sound of a band that, you know, you know, in many ways, you know, mo a lot of people haven't heard. And, um, and they were this band from Portland who, you know, incorporated post-punk and DB and, you know, they had this strange ethereal feeling their first record is very much influenced by neurosis and bits of amoebics but also like you know his hero is gone but they all lived in the same area as those bands and i believe that um they share well they do they share members with hell shock and and i actually met the drummer 
um, well, he was on tour with Warcry, which is another Portland band. And I remember saying to him, like, I absolutely love Remains of They, and I don't think he has the same... Of course, he doesn't have the same feelings as I do, because everyone has their own experience of the thing they've been in. It's like it's like Cult of Luna saying that they don't... I've heard them say that they don't like sal Salvation as much, um, and they don't play it because they, you know, it was this formative record that, mm. you know, they, they toured a lot and they played a lot and they, you know, they recorded it in a certain way and they don't have... And it's always very hard when you encounter a band that doesn't like their own music or has yeah. had their own emotional response to the music and i you know i was definitely that person after fall of effort and it was because i was heartbroken i was so heartbroken when that that band i did i started bands which you could you would call rebound bands they were bands to try and capture that feeling and you mm. can't do that and i did that and i did that over and over again and i tried so hard and for me it was like you know it was that realization that it wasn't necessarily the music it was the the people and you know mm. and I, I you know i in the preceding years after the band ended i tried to start the band again um i had a concept you know and everything and i it didn't work because because of certain certain members didn't want to do it and i am very glad that the, we didn't because i took those ideas and i decided well i'm gonna do my own mythology i'm gonna start my own i'm gonna start i love writing lyrics I hate touring. I'm going to do a book. So, I wrote a, so over a couple of years, I started writing and I wrote a book and, and I've fallen in love with that kind of aspect of it. And then over those years of like healing from my feelings towards Fall of Effort from falling in love with that again and starting, you, you know, Dave, who I do, who I started Morrow with, like Dave is incredible. He's one of my best friends. He's an incredible musician. You know, he, basically you know i was trying to start a band to try and rekindle that sonic sound that that sound that feeling of remains of the day and tragedy and fall of effort mm. neurosis and all this stuff and and you know i said to dave like you know i'm trying to do this thing would you be interested in having a go at writing some music and and um he's like yeah i'll, I'll give it a go and we've been doing carnist um which was like a kind of scrappy hardcore band that turned into a d-beat band and that was like a wonderful friendship for guys you know making music together and listening to propaganda for hours and hours and hours and, <laughs> and um and uh and then dave went away and he came back a couple of weeks later and he sent me a track and it was acoustic guitar i was like oh cool he's written some acoustic guitar stuff he'd written the whole song and he programmed the drums and it was this epic beautiful song and it was the first song from the first moro record and it was just like it gave me goosebumps and it made me realize that i could have those experiences and that they don't diminish my previous experiences mm. they just add to but what was wonderful is that you know we did we did the first record covenant of teeth and and it was a very personal experience because it was just mostly me and dave dave did all of the instrumentation my friend nicole who played in anopheli with me did um cello she's in san diego so that was like remotely done and then so we did this record it was very much the dave and alex show and then we were like <laughs> next record we're going to get our friends in and then I invited friends from all over the world. And then Mikey, I said to Mikey, and Mikey loved Morrow. And I was like, he's like, I'd love to be involved. And I was actually shocked. I was like, I, you, you, you want to be involved? And I was like, for me, that was like, and I, I, he came up and I remember Dave was, you know, Dave was there and like, you know, he said, I remember him saying like, it was, you were so happy when Mikey was there to like do his vocals. And I was like, yeah, because it's like coming home in many ways, but not coming home to something that happened before, but creating something new and bringing people in so the next record so we you know we did that record and now we're doing another one and it is a lockdown record so it's dave is you know we dave wrote all of the guitars and bass and drums and he recorded it all into his computer and the, through the magic of technology he then we took it to bolty and bolty reamped the guitars but he also reamped the bass and alistair plays bass in in morrow and you know and it's something dave dave was so worried about saying like you know we've got the bass like you know, Alice is going to have to learn all the parts and come up here and play blah, blah, blah. Why don't we just do another record where we get everybody back involved again? Yeah. We'll just do this is going to be the Morrow lockdown record. And he, I remember, he, you know, he was he was so worried about telling Alistair and and Alistair was totally cool about it. And, and I remember they were saying, this is what it's like to be in a band full of adults. <laughs> it's just like, you know, he totally understands. Like, why would you re-record it again? You know, like, and it was lovely. And, and uh, you know, I, Alistair's lovely. He's an incredible bassist. And, and it, his, his 
interpretation will will be missed but Dave's already you know we we were reamping the guitars and we we slept in the studio where you played mm. your show with Parthalon so we slept on the floor in that room and um uh and uh we were talking about what we were going to do with the next record and you know and that's the the beauty of this whole thing is like you know getting a bunch of people together and friends and you know um you know uh, that's what punk is and that's what i love about this and i don't you know i i i have really bad mental health and i struggle with with all aspects of um of of touring and being in bands and and being the front person in the band i don't but i love the experience of sharing those moments with those like moments of i'm sure you've had them yourselves mm -hmm. like uh, making music that that <laughs> mikey call is, calls it the holy shit moment where like one of your <laughs> yeah. bandmates writes a riff or something and you're like holy shit that's so good like and it's that one i feel it now like that wonderful yeah. sense of like it's like you're um, chasing that you know, buzz that 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 fucking yes, micro yeah, moment it's, within it's, a moment and you're like fuck yeah that feels good you know it is yeah, and yeah you, you, live, you never leave a goal you, really dear you're always looking for it and it, it, exactly and i think that's the thing i i get why people like playing live because you get filled with endorphins and and uh and um uh, dopamine and all these wonderful feelings and and you can you are on cloud nine and it's it's you know even the most introverted people can ha i remember um matt who would sing in um howard's alias stevie's old band like he almost threw up before every show because he was so nervous and then he'd do this incredible performances where he had a lot of like body language and moving his arms around and he was an amazing performer and he still is now he still does music and um and uh you know, but I remember him being so nervous before shows, and I and I I know that feeling. I've thrown up before shows, and you know, I think because so much is asked of you, but at the same time, you have that elation when you when it all fits together, and then it's like boom, you know, and you play. And I think that's why, you know, when I meet friends who are really really shy, and I'm like, and they're like, I I could never do this. I'm like, you, if I can do it, you can, and you should definitely do it. And yeah, um, but yeah. And it's and the new Morrow album is titled "The Quiet Art." It is, yes. Which is um, named can after you give a... us? Yeah, give us an insight into it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's uh, it's named after the film "The Quiet Earth," but um, it's uh, it's a continuation of the story that I started in in Morrow and another band that we share members with called Archivist, which is like a ethereal metal band that I did with uh, Geffried, who plays guitar in Morrow. Um, and he plays guitar in Archivist based in Vienna and I was involved in that band with so I shared my vocals with Anna um, who is an incredible one of also one of my best friends like one incredible vocalist I, she used to be in a band called Amber and I remember hearing her vocals I just like Jesus Christ this person's got the best fucking voice I've ever heard and we became friends and I was like you know and she she left that band and and you know didn't have a band and I was like I've got I just want her to be in a band because she's so incredibly talented and then so we 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 um we did we started archivist together and i was traveling to vienna which is very counterintuitive um not wanting to tour or play in bands or whatever <laughs> uh, so i was traveling over there a lot and we did three albums with that band and the mm. story in archivist this kind of science fiction story so this is incredibly pretentious and very very nerdy but so the record the last archivist record this this Moro record is a reflection of that record, but from the perspective of the characters in Moro. So it's the same events, but from a future primitivist society living in the ruins of Earth in the year 4500. Um, and they have this community, they're called the Nor. They live in North America and what was New, upstate New York, which is now a gigantic forest covering North America. And then above this is an ice shelf is a, a pan-continental glacier um, and peoples have walked across this glacier from S Scandinavia and uh, Mongolia and, and then all the peoples that are left in in America and they've created this culture where you know they're so intermingled their cultures mixes of you know Spanish um, uh, Native American you know um, just this kind of hot kind of cauldron of, of cultural experiences and they have this symbiotic relationship with nature and then the events of archivist which is this very science fiction very futuristic and they kind of come together and it's like telling that story but from a very like uh um totemic like um basic understanding of nature as as fundamentals as like you know 
light and dark and nature and and water and fire and you know how those people would un try and understand technology that's so far advanced you know it's it's indistinguishable f from magic as we know that saying um but uh yeah so that's what it's about <laughs> it's so a bunch of because i was going to ask about um archivist but um i'm delighted here that the story is continuing because i'm a big fan of that work i was going to ask is so that's pretty much archivist done now and Morrow is the continuation of the story not or really. Is there, or is there a chance of, of a revisit to that? Well, I mean, I, I, I like Archivist is still a band. Um, I just um, I, I, I had some personal stuff that I had, was going through before um, lockdown. Just just realizing that I was burnt out. I'd done was doing too much, and I didn't. It, it was suffering, and I, we always, you know, we, with all the bands I've been involved in, it's like you put the friendships and and yourself before bands bands don't matter it's like the mm. the only reason i'm in bands is a constructive friendship it's a way of like spending it's a reason to spend time with people that you love who are so far away from you and it's like i have this band anopheli in america which is you know brian who plays guitar he now lives in los, uh, los angeles and um josh he lives in texas and you know we're, we're going to do another record and we did two albums together and and i went over to america and we did these two albums and and you know, we we met at a Fall of Effort for a show in North Carolina, and we became very very close friends. And you know, we're own, we're doing the record because we love the music, but at the same time, it's just to spend time with that, each other. And you know, and it's the same with Archivist. Like I would love to continue doing it, but I just don't have I don't have it in me. But I want them. They're going to continue doing music, whether or not they'll call it Archivist. I don't know. Um, yeah. And uh, but Anna who does who shared vocals with me in that band she'll be doing vocals on i spoke to her today actually she's going to do vocals on the last morrow record because the lyrics are the same lyrics and so the bits that mm. are lyrics that were used in archivist will be sung by her which i thought would be lovely to have this like cool. dualism two different records with the same lyrics slightly different but um so yeah maybe i don't know i mean i i i did i mean i think like actually removing yourself from a from a situation where you have the stresses and Mm. Of, of being a band and then just being friends again you start to kind of forget the frustrations of like those experiences you know the kind of like time frames the yeah responsibilities and it goes back to just being friends and uh that's kind of reminded us just how important we are in each other's lives and, and i think that's really cool and i but it automatically makes me want to do something with those people again so it's just like oh we should do another record together like <laughs> so uh yeah who knows i don't know i'd like to, i'd like to do more but you know i think maybe morrow is a good way of kind of bringing those people together and and mm. um it's where it takes you. Yeah. yeah 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 but i mean it's the sheer quality of the the records like i mean <laughs> it's just it's mind-blowing really is um it's an incredible body of work really it's very yeah. hard to um to, it holds water across the board. It's really, really rare, I think. Mm. You know, and to touch it, so many different things. And so the well. fact that you're collaborating seamlessly with other musicians, and you know, it's something that I'd love to see more. That would happen more in the Irish scene. Um, we don't have enough collaborations at all. And I mean, we're a close, we're a close-minded group. We need to broaden the yeah, horizons. Yeah, some of them, like you know? the, the dag, like the dagger. Um, <laughs> The Dagda were one of those bands that, like, I discovered early on in 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 my pursuit of bands that have this incredible energy and uh, drive, but also like, there. I was talking to Mikey about this the other day. Like, he's going to do a uh, he's doing a zine and he's going to talk about those records that that had that effect. And we were talking about the Dagda the other day and like how you know they had this they had in their they reference mythology obviously the Dagda itself and mm -hmm. like um, and they played with like that whole concept of like uh kind of lefty paganism uh like mythology um you know uh and they made the sonic kind of equivalent of those feelings and that that very like earthy kind of um tangible feeling and and it's something that then those you know i remember getting i had the dag ones because i didn't have a record player i had a i had the first the the, the yellow cover i can't remember what it's called but the uh, on CD and I listened to it so much and yeah, I remember when I moved to Brighton one of the first bands I saw when I moved to Brighton was Esper Mesa oh yeah who were now like Esper Mesa yeah. Like, um, yeah yeah and they're all like famous folk musicians now uh, Lancome like, uh, Lancome yeah um, yeah they're fantastic they're they're 
Yeah. Jesus, they blew up there last year with uh, Taylor Swift took offense or some uh, Swift fan board <laughs> took offense to something they'd said or, you know, Taylor Swift's uh, <laughs> new album cover was remarkably similar to that. <laughs> oh, really? I did. <laughs> That's <laughs> amazing. <laughs> but they, I, I saw them play in a little pub and, and they were playing Emo Cross, the music that, you know, and they, mm. they did uh, split with. Who did they just split with? It's, uh, I can't remember. This is years ago. Uh, Divisions Ruin, um, yes. and yeah, like uh, I so uh, B- Burn Church, which was more modern. I think that's members of. Is that members of the Dagda? Anyway, I can't remember. Anyway, th- there is like a there's definitely a collection of like cross bands in Ireland that share members, and, but it might also be that there just aren't that many crusties who like that kind of music, which is very much the same in England. <laughs> they've, they've, all, they've all grown up, I think. I think they moved on a lot of them. <laughs> they all cut off their dreadlocks. And, uh... <laughs> exactly, you got a mortgage in there. <laughs> Jesus, came down from the trees and got a mortgage. Yes, yes, or, yes yeah. exactly. They got an umbrella without holes in. Um... <laughs> so Alex, talk to me about Worst Witch. <laughs> Uh, so, Worst Witch was another concept band. Well, um, I really wanted to start a band, like I wanted to do a band that had nothing to do with um, like like emotional crust. And I moved to Bristol and made some wonderful friends, including Alistair, who now plays bass in Morrow. Mm-hmm. Um, and we did one record and it was just like one of those bands where like we just wanted to um, do a scrappy band that played songs that weren't necessarily about anything in particular. like kind of social issues and stuff which I hadn't really done um, and I wanted to do a seven inch but we wrote too many songs um, but yeah it was a very <laughs> short-lived band but um, Liam who played guitar and bass in that band uh, we we've talked about doing lots of different bands he was gonna so I've started <laughs> for somebody who doesn't want to do any bands I've started we started another band called Reeve which is actually members of of Morrow and I really wanted Liam to play guitar in Morrow because he's a really beautiful guitarist and but we've actually talked about doing um a band based on my books and doing like a kind of this the, in my books it's like poet poems and beginning mm. with some of the chapters and i wanted to do like use them as lyrics and do like a folk band like not a heavy band so we might do that but yeah worst which was a very short-lived thing but it was really fun it was like you know we moved to i moved to bristol we did the band and then i moved to london and you know they moved on and did a bunch of different projects together but then the fucking lockdown happened and Everyone stopped yeah. doing bands, so <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, that was worth which. <laughs> yeah, and is there, is there any other bands that we haven't covered? I think there's just one sure. more. Uh, there are too too many too many bands. I've done I've done too many bands, and I'm sure everyone is very tired and sick of them. Um, um, and, uh, no, there is one. There is one band I want to ask about. Um, well, yeah. it's not me. It's actually I just got a message from the from Alan the drummer to ask you um, about the Fort Four album Zola. Zorn. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the the fourth Fall of Africa record. Oh, that's what he's talking no? about. Yeah. yeah. I, I presume F O E is Fall of Africa. Yeah. Oh, right. I just, <laughs> I just assumed. I just assumed it was four. I was like, who is he fucking talking about? No, no. no. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I and it's to... not Zola. It's Zorn. <laughs> Zorn. Yes. I think Which... I've been. I think I've been set up, Richie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. It's uh. Yeah, it's trolling me. <laughs> Zorn is a it, it, in the Lapine language, which is the language of the rabbits. It means destruction, and um, um, yeah. and it was the idea of doing a record that kind of set <coughs> would it would be quite um uh, what's the word um no it's gone uh, it would be a, 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 a allegorical of today's world where we learn nothing from past events and um so it would be the idea that civilization can reconstructs itself with all these ideals of of democracy and mm. sharing and then slides back into fascism and without even realizing it and so it would have been like the the cycle of learning from our you know the freedom freeing ourselves from fascist ideology and then slowly falling back into that same problem again and the cycle continuing. Um, so that would have been the fourth record. But in hindsight, I'm not sure it needs to exist because I guess in a way it's like mm. part of the story anyway. But um, 
And it's also nice to end on a positive note. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the record does end with the uh, the death of the death of the fascist de despot General Woundwort and uh, the freedom of, of its peoples and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, there's another yeah. band as well, Lightbearer. That's a long while. Lightbearer, yes. Uh, Lightbearer was um, a band I did after Fall of Ephrathah, um, mm. and uh, you know we, we we did our best to try and kind of create. We I think we bit off too much, bit bit off more than we could chew. Um, lots of different age groups. It never really kind of came together in, in the in that kind of cohesive way. But we we did some we had some awesome experiences and shared some shows with some amazing bands and met some lovely people who I've you know since created music with. And also was a band I got to do with Lee who did all the um, atmospherics and stuff. And he, he was he introduced me to metal like when I was eighteen, nineteen. Neurosis. Today's the day. Niall <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, he was my he was my metal friend and we're still very much friends and you know he's a wonderful person and we've done lots of stuff together and uh, so I got to do that with him and uh, Gefried was um, played bass and we've obviously done lots of bands since then but yeah um, yeah it was a, it was definitely I think it came at a very turbulent time in my life and and, and lots of other members of the band but yeah it was we, we gave it a good go but I think it was a very long experience and it was basically two bands because we started as a group and then that group kind of dwindled down to a few and then we got new members and um yeah it was a thing it was mm. a band yeah. <laughs> um, and LLF as well LLF it's uh LLF. yeah that was like a that was just a little project with my friend uh <laughs> Michaela who's in an incredible black metal band called Gottis Morda I'm not a huge fan of black metal but when I saw them play they were just incredible like three guys from italy uh just like blew me away we became really good friends with them and then michello is he does a lot of noise stuff so that was like a noise band that we did together we only did a tape release but it wasn't not it wasn't the proper band it was just like a, a, a friendship project um but yeah <laughs> so where do you get um inspirations from now at this stage alex i mean you're still obviously in touch with nature I sh um anything else science fiction yeah um yeah i think i think influences come from everywhere it's like i i think i did i did i wrote an interview recently when i was talking about like where like the way that inspiration comes i think um i oft often find that when i'm like like i watch a film uh or read a book and i and it's the feelings these certain feelings you get like there are moments of inspiration that are more like notions as opposed to fully formed things and you're like i think sometimes it comes from just that like that spark of like oh my god i feel like i really want to do this thing and sometimes it's like meeting someone who understands you know uh what you're trying to do and and that and then their skills which far outweigh mine if it's musical like it's like turning my awful you know monotone singing ideas into beautiful riffs that become so much more than just that and then um yeah i think like i i read a lot um yeah i'm, I'm very much into uh, i'm writing a book at the moment which was kind of like a um it's like a reaction to the rise of like the alt-right and 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 kind of neo-fascism and having dealt with someone in close proximity to me who was who was into that stuff and not really knowing how to react to it in a kind of uh without being angry um yeah. without like just shouting and saying you're wrong and this is ridiculous like which i did um but i just thought like i need to like somehow and also that there, there, there is a cultural really interesting cultural shift and maybe you guys probably know this like a lot of like anti-fascist kind of um uh occult pagan mythological uh recontextualizing stuff that's been stolen by nazis uh and you know um you know taking back from nationalists um you know uh sean fitzgerald is an amazing artist um you know he's one of these artists who's like taking classic you know um British ideology, Irish and Scottish and Welsh ideologies and uh, that have been usurped by nationalists and then recontextualizing them within their original place where they're much more about community and sharing ideas and and 
uh, you know, um, and I wanted to contribute to that. So I've kind of been working on this like kind of occult concept of like uh, I'm writing a grimoire which I've created like a bestiary of like demons and deities and this idea of this um, 16th century prophet who has visions of the rise of fascism in the 1930s so creates or believes he has found a pantheon of deities and in a way it was like a reaction to H.P. Lovecraft because obviously he was you know very very much a, a racist for a lot of his life although towards the end of his life he seems to have kind of changed his views on things I know there's some letters that he wrote about that but he was a very much and but he created this in quite entire genre of cosmic horror uh, that is beloved by everyone but it 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 has shadows of his xenophobia and and um, racism and I think like I think there's a especially with like Lovecraft Lovecraft country and like ways of like recontextualizing things and saying like okay so this exists how can we take that away from people who are trying to use it for evil reasons and take it back to when it wasn't that thing and and uh, or using it as a way of telling new stories um, like with Lovecraft Country which was a way of like talking about civil rights in America uh, through the lens of H.P. Lovecraft which if, if you haven't seen it it's a fa fascinating kind of take it's based on a book um, and I wanted to do something similar to that, where I create like a pantheon of like entities, deities, whatever that are fighting for good, <laughs> uh, fighting for the idea of like where mythology comes from, you know, all of these things which, which came out of culture in a way of like understanding the world around us and understanding nature and humans are very good at putting things in boxes and saying this is that and this is this mm. and you know the you know where where did where did all this come from? Was it just the survival you know the the rustle in the grass could be a lion or it could just be the wind but i'm going to run away so regardless i'm going to survive and then that becomes dancing to start rains and then it becomes you know shedding blood for mm. gods and then it becomes organized religion and then it becomes yeah. you know, it's like it's a it's a interesting how you know all cultures have these you know um beliefs and uh, I wanted to do something similar to that, so that's what I'm working on at the moment, and that's they're very much influenced by all these zines that are coming out at the moment, like um, uh, Rituals and Declarations, Weird Zine, um, uh, Wolverstein, um, just really awesome anti-fascist people who love mythology and paganism and taking it away from the fash, and that's yeah. really cool. <laughs> uh, he has to come over to Ireland, Howard, and get oh, Steve. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a weekend there, Alex, of um, just just places and things I could show you that would you just, I think you would get a lot of uh, inspiration. appreciation out of Sounds inspiration wonderful. from. I'll be there. Uh, <laughs> even just some of the local, even some of the local legends around here in Passage West where mm -hmm. I live. Um, there's just some fantastic stuff. It's, it's, it's a deep well of, of interesting things. And you can see how it's shaped the town over hundreds and hundreds of years. Right. And been occupied by British forces for so long and being yeah. fighting, you know, I mean, Fascism wasn't really a big thing here, I don't think. We had the Fine Gael Blue Shirt Party at one point, but it was more a sort of a... It wasn't really diving into Nazism. It was more like anti-British at the time. Yeah, yeah. But that's not that's not the excuse. It is, it is what it is. But, uh, you know, we have a rich history here of mythology and having it removed from the pantheon, from the thought process of the individual and moving towards a Protestant sort of ideological logical yeah. um bow down to god go to mass every sunday and you know go to the right mass not the other mass the right mass <laughs> <laughs> and all this kind of crack but you can see underneath it all it became like underground music to a certain extent there's this simmering mythological thing bubbling underneath everything else and it's fantastic there's there's evidence of it everywhere so if it is if, if it is something that happens if you remember Aaron Arden, please get in touch i'd be delighted oh, no, to show you a few things My you know i think you'll get great inspiration from it my partner mm. and I will be on your doorstep next weekend. So do it <laughs> do any, any fucking time. <laughs> Spare room is ready to go. <laughs> and lastly, let's not forget that you have done and designed T-shirts um, and patches <laughs> promoting animal rights, veganism, and you know, can you just give us a brief overview on that? Um, so I wanted to. Like I, you know, I, I wanted to contribute to like the animal rights movement, but um, I felt that uh, I also wanted some really angry animal rights t-shirts. 
So I thought, well, I'll make some really angry animal rights t-shirts and I'll sell them and then I'll give some money to charity and then kind of kept on doing it and then kept on coming up with silly ideas and, and friends also came up with amazing ideas like the one I did recently, which was totally Dave from Morrow's idea. It was to do a municipal waste homage. I saw it. Brilliant. Nutritional yeast. That's <laughs> entirely him, entirely him. And uh, just, um, I... Yeah, it was just a relief. It was a cool way to like raise money for hunt stabs and stuff. And um, my good friend Mikey Vino Sangre, who prints for lots of like bands in the UK, um, and he's awesome dude who's helped me keep it going. And he's um, he's actually playing bass in Reeve, which is really cool. We've talked about doing a band together for years, but he prints them all. And then also my Chris, my friend Chris Murphy printed them for years, who I've known since I was in college. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just like another thing to like you know kind of try and contribute something by but uh and it's fun it's really it's it's you know it's a pain in the ass like everything like since brexit um you know it's all everything's becoming far harder and and mm. uh with with customs and nature's tariff codes and all this bullshit and having to send things and everything getting returned to me if you do one thing wrong in a fucking customs form but i'm sure you guys have are getting all that shit as well because yeah, you know, absolutely yes yeah um but it's uh, that is a one huge cutting off your nose to spite your face. But um, uh, yeah, I, I guess we're hopefully again. This comes back to the idea of like, right at the beginning. The, you know, the idea of hope for the future is that you know, you know, as a, as punks, we were always told that borders get rid of borders. You know, but in our lifetime, we've seen so many like borders have become so you know uh, uh, the cultural zeitgeist of, of you know just put you know especially with America America under Trump with you know this very isolationist attitude and then you know but I I'm I hope that the next generation very quickly realizes that that was a big mistake and that sharing of ideas and culture and stuff like it, it there's no denying that we are all you know none of us own this land and and we 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 shouldn't separate ourselves in such a profound way mm. and, and it's it just seems like it's going to be something that that will overshadow so much of the future unless we 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 change it but then you know there are far bigger things i mean my friend my friend chelsea said to me recently like you think this is bad yeah <laughs> wait for the water wars wait for the you know you know equatorial <laughs> countries uninhabitable the massive migrations of people they're like you know and then we were already seeing like the beginnings of 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 that you know and and the the insidiousness of capitalism and scary um, time it feels uh, for myself personally that i'll be tagging out of this 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 whole deal just in time <laughs> Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, we're, we're the last generation, aren't we? We're, the, mm. we're, 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 we're lucky in the many, many ways that uh, we have, you know, such a finite time left. We've got 30, 40 years if we're lucky. And yep. I think anybody that's coming after that is going to have a real problem on their hands across the board that they, that we're, you know, it's not that they haven't heard of these problems that are coming, but it seems clear that hearing about problems and actually encountering a problem are two different things. But this is that's the, that's the thing, and I, my friend James said this recently. It's like the 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 problem with so many of these things, including coronavirus, is that until it happens to you, it's mm. happening to someone else. Mm. And I think that they, we haven't lived. We've lived through this era of peace since the Second World War, to to many extents, and especially in the West. Like we see these things, and we can have the time to kind of create false narratives, and you know vaccine hesitancy we can ignore the fact that you know generations were lost to polio uh there wasn't vaccine hesitancy my my mum remembers well, my grandmother lost her first child to polio and uh my mum remembers iron lungs and mm. she remembers like the kids in the hospital who died and it's like that happened and you know i i think because we have this, it's an ex existential thing. It's this thing outside of us that's so um, nebulous and amorphous. And then when it actually starts to happen, there's the, my friend James, who's you know very much you know radical left and, and anarchist, and and but he believes in the good of human nature. And when really bad things happen to everyone, there's that that last bastion of hope, which is that people will work together and 
people so, do help each other regardless of the colour of their skin, regardless of their gender, regardless of their sexuality. Community. Community. Yeah, exactly. And, I, you know, we will see the beginnings of awful... I mean, we already are. We're seeing these awful events mm. as a result of climate change. And, you know, it's just not happening to everyone at the same time, which is, I guess, is how everything's happened in history, is that, it's, you know, it's like the classic, you know, they came for the... You know, and then it happened to me. You know, like it's like, it's uh, yeah. <laughs> human human life is too short, and we don't experience enough to have be able to reflect within our own lifetimes. I guess. And like, yeah, and I mean, you have um, a thing as well that if you buy um, digital wreaths, the fall of Ephrafa, you the donations will go to Trees for Life in the Scottish. Yeah, yeah, we decided. Islands. Yeah, I had to convince the rest of the band if it uh, to took me a year and a half to convince them to let me put that demo out <laughs> and uh and then we we agreed that we would we would donate the money to charity which is which is really cool and we've donated a lot of money which is really cool mm. um and i got to put that tape out which was really nice because uh i was always super excited about like i that's the, the, the another thing with like punk is like those those little bits of history those tiny fragments even if it sounds like shit it's still like this you know the the kind of um the cocoon that will house the butterfly you know like even if it's all yeah. recording you want to hear it if your favorite band had a shitty demo that no one had ever heard you'd want to fucking hear it. <laughs> you would be on discogs <laughs> and you would have it in your want list <laughs> and uh so that was what i wanted to do and we did it so it was cool um yeah they won't let me release the inlay demos though which is i ask them again you know keep asking it took, it, it took uh, a year they, and a half last time <laughs> they wrote some very eloquent emails about why they don't want me to put it out so i will let them win this one but um <laughs> yeah but i love them all so it's okay. <laughs> run towards the shaking grass run towards the shaking grass alex <laughs> <laughs> alex cf thank you for so much for coming on the show continue You're to right. inspire and create mm -hmm. cheers thank you very much and thank you for your time sorry for rambling no um and, uh, Fantastic. Yeah. It was great right, having you on the show, man. Thank you. Cheers. Uh, hit subscribe if you like Metal Cell Podcast. Howard, thanks a million for coming on as co-host. Thanks for having me.